dark and dense and dull. Hello folks! Welcome back to my channel and this video is my March reading wrap-up. I read 16 books, which feels like a lot. I don't need to make excuses for how much I read. I read a lot and I'm also, I also have lots of time to read. So anyway, let's get into it. Yeah, I read 16 books, a mix of... I have quite, quite a pile of stuff I physically owned, but even then I often listen to the audio on library from my library or whatever. First book I finished was Contact by Carl Sagan. Oh my god, this feels like so long ago, but I I absolutely love this. Um I all I was familiar with the movie that stars Jodie Foster. Uh the movie is quite a bit different. It, I think it's quite modernized. Um and it's definitely like Hollywood eyes, like the story is kind of streamlined and Hollywood eyes, but I think it maintains the core of what this story is supposed to evoke in the viewer or the reader. Um, so this is a, so Carl Sagan might be more, Carl Sagan might be more known for his nonfiction work and his um, television series Cosmos, uh, but this is a fiction story um, the story follows Ellie as she pursues a career as an astrophysicist with a focus on using radio telescopes to scan for signals that could be a sign of extraterrestrial intelligent life. Her project discovers a message coded within pulses that count out prime numbers and contain a message to build a mysterious machine. So this is a scientist's fictional take on what first contact would look like. Um, and the story takes place, like, from the span of, like, the late 70s through the 90s. I, I thought Ellie is a fascinating character. Um, I will say, so the writing is third person, kind of very focused around Ellie, but it's very removed. It, it very much feels like some omnipotent presence is, like, observing this thing from very far away. So we don't, we don't get a lot of, like... Ellie thought through this thing, Ellie was feeling this. And we don't get a lot of internal thoughts, we get a lot of external stuff, um, which might make the reading feel like a little bit dry, um, but um, I think it suited, it suited the story. Um, I thought Ellie was fascinating. Um, you definitely see how she is shaped by her experiences. She's described as someone who is, quote, determined to be as tough-minded as possible without abandoning the sense of wonder that was driving her in the first place. Um, and she has a fantastic speech about why our generation should be devoting attention to the pursuit of trying to find extraterrestrial life. Um, I have to read this paragraph because it just speaks so much to what I love about um, learning about space and astrophysics right now and what I love about this story. Um, we're just beginning the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You know how many possibilities there are. This is the time to leave every option open. This is the time to be optimistic. If we lived in any previous time in human history, we could wonder about all of this all of our lives and we couldn't do anything to find an answer. But this time is unique. This is the first time when anybody's been able to look for extraterrestrial intelligence. You've made the detector to look for civilizations on the planets of millions of other stars. Nobody's guaranteeing success, but can you think of a more important question? Imagine them out there sending us signals and nobody on Earth is listening. That would be a joke, a travesty. Wouldn't you be ashamed of your civilization if we were able to listen and didn't have the gumption to do it? It speaks to me. I love it. Um, also, I think um, while reading this, I had the thought that this is a story that has to that requires a female protagonist because there are parallel themes of the sexism that Ellie faces as a woman in science and the attitudes towards scientists that want to devote resources to looking for intelligent life and also the skepticism of the non-science world about the eventual findings that they find. As I kind of hinted at, the writing is very dense. But I don't think of it as like a pretentious dense, it's just that the reader needs a rudimentary understanding of the complex science, technological, and philosophical context of the events at play. So there are definitely times where this reads like a nonfiction, 
but I think Sagan is an excellent teacher in, even if you don't understand 100% of it, you understand enough that when, you know, the, that when the signal comes in the form of pulses in prime numbers, you understand why is that realistic and why is that important. Um, and also I love that Sagan explores so much more than just the science of imagining what first contact would look like. We see in-depth discussions about the implication for tense international relationships. So this book was written when we were still within the Cold War, so there's a lot of discussion around the relationships between the US and the Soviet Union. Um, you know, we talk about the technological and economic development that is going to come out of this new technology that they learn about. Um, and my favorite conversation revolves around the intersection of the edge of scientific discovery and religion. Um, and I think the movie actually touches on that pretty well, too. Much more succinctly, um, but there's definitely, like, almost fanatical but, like, famous ev evangelical preacher characters in this book that Ellie does go and, like, sit down and talk to them and be like, why is this real and why is, you know why is this not a signal of the end times and like why is this also not at odds with i mean ellie doesn't necessarily say this but i think the book does a good job of saying that like you know scientific discovery is not necessarily at odds with the concept of faith and i find that really interesting anyway um i love this i don't think it's going to be for everyone because what i said about the writing being really tense but since i am am on like a science nonfiction kick this was great. This was everything I wanted it to be. So the next, we're going to talk about these four books together, even though I didn't read them all in order. So I read the rest of the Darkest Rising series that I started in January. So I read The Dark is Rising, Green Witch, The Grey King, and the conclusion, Silver on the Tree. Uh, these are all by Susan Cooper. This is a child, uh, this is a children's YA fantasy series that was written in the 50s and 60s. Um, so after the first book, uh, the series took a turn for the dark and dense and dull. It was a disappointment. Um, so we're, so in, hold on. In The Darkest Rising, the next book, we are introduced to the character as well, who is an 11-year-old boy, but he comes into his power as one of the old ones who serve the light. Um, the themes around good and evil are still interesting from the perspective of, as an adult reader, but I feel like as a YA novel, it makes the antagonist into like this really vague idea of evil instead of what we saw in the first book, which was talking about evil through human behavior, the way that the force of dark manipulates human behavior to serve its needs. And um, I also talk about, well, in I also talk about uh, mostly Silver on the Tree, but a little bit more thoughts around the whole series in my last video, which is my first reading vlog. I listened to the last three books, mostly on audiobook, because um, the books are, you know, they're like four hours, five hours, they're pretty short. Um, I do recommend the audiobook for the fourth book specifically, Silver, uh, The Grey King, because a lot of this, because the story mostly takes place in Wales and there is a lot of Welsh phrases and words. And even though they talk about the pronunciation of Welsh, it is what you imagine it's going to sound like and what it actually sounds like is very different. I think Welsh is really beautiful, if not very difficult to actually pronounce from my perspective. The human character of Jane remains my favorite character and every time I was reading a book where she wasn't in it, I was bored. Um, so by the last book we get some more tie-ins to the Arthurian legend. I still feel like the connection is tenuous, it's definitely not a retelling. I am, I am like vaguely familiar with the Arthurian legend. I suspect that if I knew, if I was more familiar with the source material and not like the dumbed down children's TV version of the story there I might be able to pick up on like more parallel themes and it would be more interesting but I'm grasping I'm 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 as I, I in my notes I say like I'm just looking for a sense of why did the story take this turn when the first one was so charming and interesting the next book I picked up was part of my reread unhaul project where I reread books that I don't remember anything about 
um, to see whether or not I want to keep them. And uh, so this one I picked up was Bone Shaker by Sherry Priest. Uh, so this is a post-Civil War gold, gold Rush timeline mashup set in a steampunk Seattle with zombies. Barely. Um, so downtown Seattle has been walled off because some toxic gas is leaking into the city. The gas makes people turn into zombies. The gas is very heavy, so it's mostly retained by a very tall wall. Spoiler alert, there are still people living within the city. Um, so this was sort of a DNF. Uh, I heavily skimmed the last third of the book to find out what happens. Um, but like at least by halfway through, I was really, really done with the story. I was really bored by it. Um, the concept is the most interesting part of the book by far. I had no connections to our characters and the zombies are barely present. <laughs> Um, there's an interesting idea touched on that had the potential for this to, like, be labeled as, like, a climate change commentary, but it was never really explored. Um, the idea is, like, this toxic gas is slowly filling the bowl that is this walled-off city and may one day spill over into the rest of the country because we don't know how much it is. We don't know if it's ever going to stop. So maybe instead of, like, ignoring the problem, we should be trying to learn to live in the new normal with the gas. The idea of, like, our current way of life is no longer sustainable. We need to adjust to the new normal. That's where I got, like, that idea from. And then I kind of saw it touched on in here, but then the idea never went anywhere. Uh, let's see. I think what characters of color that are in this story are quite, are portrayed quite problematically. There's a lot of acknowledgement of the Chinese immigrants that live in the international district that got walled off, but the first Asian character we meet doesn't talk because his tongue has been cut out. And then we don't get another Asian character with a name who talks until like 60% of the way in. And there are, and just, there's just more and more stereotypes that just keep popping up. Like every character is some kind of stereotype and there's not, and like I get, okay, the his you know the historical fiction aspect of what those ideas would have been at the time but this is also fiction with zombies you could have more characters who challenge these racist ideas but you didn't um my favorite character is angeline who is a duwamish indigenous woman overall she's a badass but i kind of feel like making her an indigenous woman was just there so that this nasty character can refer to her as an Indian princess, so I feel weird about it. Anyway, um, this is going to be an unhaul. Ooh, okay, so the next book I finished was one of my favorites. Uh, I listened to the audiobook of When No One Is Watching, written by Alyssa Cole, narrated by Susan Dalian and Jay Ossing. I have never felt so close to an anxiety attack since the election, and I mean that in a good way because this is a thriller and it's built upon very real elements in our current society. Um, I think Owned Voices Black reviewers can explain the tension better than I can, so please seek those out if you want more details about like actual things that are portrayed in the story. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about like things that I liked and I related to. Um, but, like, those are going to be very, very personal, not talking about the whole thing as a whole. The whole thing as a whole. Great. Um, so honestly, uh, I identified a lot with Theo, which is kind of uncomfortable, but also, like, why? It's the reality. Like, why am I ashamed of something that's real? Um, <clears throat> so I say that I identify with him because I am very familiar with the feeling of your gut telling you that something is off about a comment or a conversation, but you don't have the right context to understand what's wrong. So you feel like you can't call it out because you can't explain what the problem is. I get that. <laughs> um, I also really love the scene with Theo and Sydney in the new bodega because it is a perfect example of how doing the right thing as a person with privilege, witnessing discrimination, it's often not going to be rewarded the way that we've been taught to expect. It's like you either don't say anything and then you are in a way reinforcing the bad behavior because they're never called out on it or you know you step in and use your privilege to call it out because you know that you're not going to suffer for it but then you know the person you're defending 
just feels uncomfortable and doesn't have the energy to perform gratitude and then that feels weird because like we're used to being praised when we do the right thing and we need to we as white people as privileged people need to understand that we are not when we do the right thing we are not owed gratitude you do the right thing because it's right and that's it um granted the right thing is not always an easy answer but it's complicated and that's okay. Um, I also really love the plotline about Sydney creating her own historical tour for the neighborhood. Um, and I think Theo's perspective is uh, valuable to that conversation. Um, because along the way, they, you know, he, he's helping her with the research. And I, I, I really like the nuance of like the discussion of slavery as a business and the repercussion among banks and the financial industry of the nation when slavery was abolished um and the idea of like the slavery business owners the ceos of the day they just moved into banking there's this quote of all these guys never gave up much power they just put on a different suit you know this is a nuanced conversation that's kind of explaining how deep the roots of institutional racism really go um also i fucking i fucking love the ending um, it was resolved enough that it helped me, like, release some tension and, like, feel satisfied. But it also peeks under the rug to see that, like, the big bad is by no means vanquished, which... This is excellent. This was amazing. <laughs> I loved it. Um, and I, I really like the audiobook depiction of it. Okay, the next book I finished was a short story collection translated from Japanese. So this is Where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsuda translated by Polly Barton. Um, this was this was a good time. This is a collection of short stories that deal with women in Japanese society with some elements of traditional Japanese ghost folklore in each story. Um, so let's see. So I didn't really know I'm basically gonna like I'm, I wrote like a little Goodreads review and I'm basically just gonna reiterate the points I made. Um, so I didn't really know what to expect going into it. Um, I'm intrigued by Japanese folklore but I'm not super familiar with it um, but I did really enjoy the incorporation of traditional stories into modern scenarios examining the expectations and issues put on women. Um, I feel like this would be a great collection to read in a class where you could spend more time discussing the stories and researching the specific cultural context of the stories um, but I also think that like you're gonna find something interesting in there even if you go in without a lot of contextual knowledge. Um, yeah, it was cool. Um, uh, and I put this, I had been, this was, this had been put on my radar when I was looking for books for the reading and translation readathon. And it just, the waitlist was long and it didn't become available until, until more recently. <laughs> That's a readathon that happens in December. So if you are interested in a readathon like that and are looking for translated works to keep in mind, this one, it's, it's, it's short, it's digestible, it doesn't get too dark, it's not too fluffy, it doesn't get too dark. I think, I think there's something in there to appeal to a lot of people. So the next book I finished was a memoir. This is A Girl's Guide to Missiles, Growing Up in America's Secret Desert by Karen Piper. Um, so this is a memoir of a girl who grew up on the China Lake Missile Range where they manufactured weapons such as the Tomahawk Missile and the Sidewinder. The premise is more interesting than the execution. Um, I, while reading it, I kept comparing it to Educated by Tara Westover because there's definitely some similar big themes. Um, themes of isolated, sheltered upbringing, toxic religious beliefs, and having to readjust to the real world as an adult. Um, I think Missiles doesn't have as consistent a theme or perspective woven throughout the story the author starts to make some interesting realizations about the nature of war as a business or realizing how much psychological psychological denial is a cultural necessity of where she grew up. It's like there's the beginnings of all these interesting ideas, but they never really feel flushed out. Um, there's also a lot of moments where the author has these realizations or makes these statements that just kind of feel like they came out of the blue. 
like w one of them I noticed was like how the author was like, you know what, I decided that like, I know I don't want to have children and I don't really think marriage is for me. I um, mean, given that like she was raised like in the 60s and 70s in like a conservative religious environment, these ideas are quite at odds with the time period and the culture of her upbringing and we don't really get any discussion of how the author arrived at these ideas or like did she struggle with them did, did she feel challenged by her society like they're just like this is who i am as a person and we're like but why um so it's, it, I feel like this would be interesting if you enjoy a memoir with a specific historical backdrop and you're more interested in like the memoir per portion. But if, but I picked this up because I was quite interested in like the China Lake and weapons industry and that felt pretty minimal. Like I understand, and she does explain pretty well, that a lot of that stuff is very, um, what's the word? that a lot of the information is classified and it's kind of hard to find the declassified information that actually forms a whole story. So I, I understand that. Um, but it meant that the part that I found the most interesting was perhaps the most lackluster. Anyway, I grabbed this from a free library. I don't regret reading it. It was interesting, just, but um, I will be returning this to a free library. All right, so the next book I read was Caught Up in You by Roni Lauren. This is the fifth installment of lo of her Loving on the Edge erotic romance series. In the story, we follow Kelsey, who is Bryn's sister, and we met her in the first installment of this series. I don't really have much to say about this. Um, it kind of feels more of the same in a good way. I've, in, you know, past reviews, you know, I've probably read one of these a month for the past couple months. It's a steamy romance that has dominant sub relationships and I really like the way the author handles information around this type of relationship in terms of like consent and boundaries and communication. Um, specifically in this book, um, there's one point that really stood out to me. Um, I did really love the scene at a company dinner where Kelsey reclaims a sense of dignity in the face of a lot of people at this company retreat treating her poorly because she's a former sex worker. Um, it's kind of, It was kind of like a little bit of conflict that was throughout the story and I do love how she basically was like, I'm done feeling ashamed for this, fuck you all, you're the assholes. Um, so. Great. All right, the next book I finished was um, Same Man Volume 3, Dream Country by Neil Gaiman. Um, I felt pretty meh about this one. Um, maybe I am just kind of falling out of love with the series. I, I kind of picked it up because, like, I have friends who really love it and, you know, Gaiman's a big name and the series is super famous, but I feel like going forward, if I want to read more in the series, I'm just going to check out volumes from my library rather than reading them. Um, in this one, there's an interesting installment that... Uh, plays with the origin of the story, the origin story of the play Hamlet, written by Shakespeare, that deals with his son. Um, it's it's an interesting, fantastical interpretation of that, and nothing else really made an impression on me. Um, I will say, I, I can't remember if all the volumes I've read have this, but um, at the end of these compendium novels, we get a, a script from one of the chapters in here and we get to see a little bit into the creator's minds as to how they shape the story and like what they were trying to convey with the artistic choices. Like I didn't read through it fully, but um, if you're somebody who's interested in how does like a graphic novel go from concept to finished product, that might be an interesting thing to look into. The next book I finished was another find from a little free library. This is A is for Alibi by Sue Grafton. Um, this is the first in her Kinsey Milhome Mysteries. Um, I enjoyed this. It was just kind of a easy read of a private investigator mystery. It's set in the 80s, which is an interesting time period because we don't have cell phones yet, but we are starting to see some computer records and databases. So it's an, I think it's an interesting time of for a private investigator story. Um, 
I actually really like their protagonist, <laughs> um, which is contrary to many of the reviews that I read. Uh, I realized that it's, she's, it, what I liked was she's basically has all of the character tropes of a typical male private investigator, but she's a woman. Um, and I just kind of realized that, like, these are behaviors that, like, if the protagonist was a man, we wouldn't bat an eye at. But because she's a woman, oh no, she's grumpy, she drinks too much, she doesn't, like, eat good food, how dare she? Um, so I was just kind of like, yeah, honey, smoke your cigarettes, drink your alcohol. Don't bother being polite when you don't feel like it. I relate. <laughs> um, the twist at the end of this isn't too creative, I but I did, like, have doubts along the way of, like, okay, I think it's this person, but, like, it could be this person or it could be this person. They all have a sense of motive and they all have, like, you know, they all have motive and all of their alibis are flimsy. Um, I liked seeing how all the pieces came together. You know, I... I've said this before, like, I'm starting to dip my toes in mystery novels, so, like, I don't really have a good sense for, like, what's really good and what's just kind of okay, but I enjoyed it. I would be interested in reading a couple more from the series. I do have to mention, though, that there is a moment where a child is described in an oddly sexual manner. I don't know what that's about. It's kind of one of those, it's one of those things that definitely kind of draws my feelings down a little bit, and it's like, I'd be interested in reading more. I'm not sold on paying for copies of this. This can be a series that is, you know, borrowed from my library in the future, and that's fine. Ooh, okay. So, all right. So the next book um, is the next book I finished. I borrowed from my library. That is Escaping Exodus by Nikki Drayden. Um, I've seen quite a few people in the process of reading it and reviewing it. Um, I really do love this story. I've also got some problems with it. Um, so conceptually, this is fantastic. Like the first half of the book, I thought it was going to be a five star. Um, so this deals with a faring community residing within the body of a giant space whale creature, and it leads to fascinating conversations about living in harmony or at odds with your environment. Um, I also love that this is a matriarchal, matriarchal society, but it still exhibits a lot of sexism. Um, and it turns into an interesting examination around gender norms and assumptions. Um, I love our messy protagonists, and I love their love story that cannot be. Um, but I also like that this is a polyamorous society, and it kind of sets up a world where the eventual, like, love triangle, love quadrangle stuff, they feel tense, but they don't feel overly dramatic or catastrophic. Like, there is this acknowledgement that, like, you can be totally in love with this person, but also, like, this person fills this other part of your life, and this person fills this other role in your life, and all three of them can be very valuable, intimate relationships. Great. Um, <clears throat> so my issue is the pacing in the second half. The plot really starts jumping forward without developing the events or the decisions of our characters. Um, the number of plot twists just kind of felt like the author wanted to include every idea she had and leave nothing for later books. Um, I mean, there is a second book out. I'm definitely going to read the next book. I've already heard that this pacing problem is present in that one too. So I am moderating my expectations, but I am excited to read it. I can be both. Uh, the next book I finished... <laughs> Next book I finished was The City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. Uh, this one I talk quite a bit, I talk about quite a bit in my reading vlog video. I devoured it in like two days. I mean, technically three. I read like 50 pages the first day and then devoured it the next couple of days. Um, I, I, I love this so much. It's going to be a contender for one of my favorite reads of the year. Um, this complex world gives a lot of reread value, but I didn't feel too lost to follow what was at stake. Um, I loved all of our characters, or like, I loved to hate them, or I loved to mistrust them, or whatever. Um, I bought the second book. I'm gonna try and put off reading it for at least like a month, a month and a half, because the third book doesn't come out in paperback until July. So I don't have to wait too long, but I don't want to like, 
I want to like space it out so that I'm not just left waiting for like three months until I can buy the paperback version. I love it. So the next book I finished was Braiding Sweetgrass. This was actually a book I started like the first or second day of the month and I just... This might be the first book where I was like, I could just binge this, but I kind of, I kind of just want to live with it for a while. I want to read like a chapter or two every night, um, just because it was really comforting and really beautiful and I, it's great. Um, so, okay, like talking, actually talking about the book, uh, where do I start? Uh, so a lot of folks have been raving about it. It is well-deserved. This is an elegant blend of botany and environmental science, memoir, and an exploration of traditional indigenous knowledge. The author is a member of... Oh, so this is by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And uh, she is a member of the Potawatomi Nation, who are from the upper Midwest region, along the Great Lakes and upper Mississippi. But she also has chapters that explore the tribal knowledge and the flora of the Pacific Northwest and the Bible Belt self. I, in that chapter she doesn't say exactly where she is but in the Pacific Northwest she talks about being along the Oregon coast. My favorite chapters were the chapter on the gift economy which I've, I've always I need to go back and find like what her word what her the term she uses for like our our, our economy where you um use money and like everything has like monetary value and like labor has monetary value as opposed to a gift economy where like all the things you need you know food and water and well not water water isn't a commodity but like food food is free and i really like that she has this realization where she was she was in a market where like everything was free they were refusing her money and she realized like I could take everything and she kind of realizes but now I feel bad and I look at my basket and I have I have what I need and I don't need to take more and she kind of you know teaches from her own experience that um we think that in like a free gift economy everybody would be greedy and people would go without but she's like no but when you actually live in it like you go through a phase where you are greedy and then you real once you are actually satisfied then you realize that like no but I, I don't actually need to take as I don't need to hoard stuff because I am I know that I will always be taken care of and like that sense of security kind of allows you to like even out um and that's something that like I've actually minusculely witnessed a little bit in myself because um I kind of went like as I was doing lots of walks and documenting where all of my little free libraries were in my neighborhood, I started to acquire a lot of books. And because I'm reading a lot of new books and not like, um, and I haven't really been good at putting books back in, 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 in and not just like just taking because it's there, but also like taking one and leaving one and creating this sense of balance um so like I had like a month or two where I kind of went crazy just taking everything I wanted and now I've kind of been like yeah yeah that that doesn't feel good for more than like a month or two like I'm I, I understand that long term I'm in a better place where I say no more often than I say yes Anyway, that resonated with me because that was something that I had also recently experienced. Um, my other favorite chapter is called, let's see, Mishkos Kenomagwen, The Teachings of Grass. And this is a chapter that is organized like a scientific research paper. So we have part one, introduction, part two, literary review, part three, hypothesis, part four, methods. And she's recounting, um, one of her students that she was an advisor for um trying to do some research about sweetgrass and um some other things and the challenges she was met from a traditional western scientific community being like well why should we approve this research project we don't see any benefit we don't think like there's nothing in science that supports your hypothesis like there's nothing that we stand to gain from this information but she pushes through with it and like documents the process as a scientific as you know documents the process in the language of science to show that 
there is scientific fact behind this indigenous knowledge that has just been accepted as truth. And it's, and it's really interesting. And it's really interesting to also see that like, the very skeptical white male um, person sitting on the board. And, I don't know. I've never been to grad school. I don't. I don't know what this process is. Um, <laughs> um, but just have have their skepticisms be completely disproven, and like that's really satisfying. But it's also frustrating to see um, how much knowledge, how much truth is discredited just because it has never been discovered the proper way. It has never been discovered in a lab. It has never been discovered with hard numerical data. If you are someone who is going into academia, this is really important. If you're someone who wants to pursue a career in science, this is really important. If you are concerned about living in harmony with your environment, um, you know, if who is concerned about climate change and living in harmony with your environment. This is great. This is also like a really great climate activism book that doesn't feel very doom and gloom. It, you know, it, it does show that like living in harmony with the earth is something that has been done before and we could go back to it. And you are not alone if that is something you want to pursue. Anyway, this is great. I'm, I splurged and I got this beautiful um, hardcover milkweed edition that has like a ribbon and everything. And I'm really glad because this is, I don't know if you can see like all of my tabs <laughs> in there because they're like the same color as the paper. But um, I feel like this is something that I'm gonna, this is something that I could, I could go back to. I could just pull it out and like read a chapter and feel like I'm learning something and like feel comforted and feel like connected to ev everything. <laughs> um, so this is great. Five stars. Ten stars. Um, and the last book I read in March was A Close and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers. This is the second book in the Wayfarer series, the first one being A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Um, this is very different, but it's still like a very solid installment in the series. So in this book we follow Lovelace, who is a former ship's AI, but she is now residing within a humanoid body kit. Um, and there is a parallel timeline that uh, talks about the origin story of the character of Pepper. Um, the as I was reading the story, um, the AI story is fa is a fascinating analogy for autism or anxiety or any disabilities that include symptoms of sensory overload, body dysphoria, and panic symptoms. Um, and I think this is one of the amazing things that like fantasy and science fiction and horror do can do really well is instead of like replicating a real life condition. Um, you can kind of take elements of that and then kind of explore them through something quite creative. Um, so I, I, I feel like if, if you have someone in your life who struggles to understand things like sensory overload or body dysphoria, I think like this book would give them a starting place to like understand it without the stakes of you do or do not have, you do or do not believe what an actual person's telling you. Does that make sense? Anyway, um, it's interesting. It's interesting. It just, it, it gives you a lot to think about. Um, so one of my favorite takeaways from the story is the discussion around the legality of um, Lovey's and Pepper's existence. There's a line in there about those who wrote the laws forgot to make room for people like us. And we, we see again and again how their lives are impacted by the letter of the law being at odds with the reality of them as people who deserve rights and protections. Um, so similar to Small Angry Planet, the story is told with a lot of patience and care and generosity. Like even as these characters struggle, they are surrounded by a very supportive found family. And I love that we also get to see the side characters growth. 
as they learn what their friends need to survive and feel safe. So lovely. It's, it's, it is fascinating how the books in this series can explore some really heavy topics in a way that doesn't diminish their severity, but also makes you feel safe. It's like, yes, I will explain this to you again and again until you understand it. And now we move forward, more informed, more whole beings working together <laughs> to live in this world. It is great. Um, so I, I, need, I need to get in line for the third book. And I know the fourth book just came out. So um, yeah, this is great. It's a lovely end to my quite lengthy reading month. Um, great. Uh, if you have made it to the end of the video, you're a champ. Um, so I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I hope I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will have my social media links in the description box below. If you want to connect with me elsewhere, I will also have the name and authors of all of the books. If you would like to refer to them in the future, um, I'll catch you on my next video. Bye!